Hello, hello. <laughs> okay, hello, everyone. Ashley, if you could pin me, that would be great. I am on the road right now, and we are in Santa Barbara, LightNet, um, doing the Holo Movement Purpose Lab, where we are interviewing 100 people who found their purpose and calling in life, um, doing the Holo Movement Purpose Lab. And we're going to be launching that. Um, we're going to be launching Okay, so I'm back here. Sorry about that. I'm on a new computer because um, my computer got locked into a room last night. So we're making do here on the road. But because, um, I think if you close your simulcast window, then you won't get the echo. So making do. Here I don't on the have road. that open. There, there's another window open with your simulcast, your which is where your echo is coming from. But not on my computer. I don't have that open. There's another window open with your simulcast, which is where your echo. Wow, so interesting. So, um, you're clear now, no echo. Okay, good. That's interesting. Okay, so perfect. Okay, um, we uh we lost power yesterday during our presentation too. So there's a lot of interesting, beautiful energy happening and so many synchronicities. I'm in a high end synchronicity loop right now, but I want to welcome uh, Dan Winters today. He um Winter he is a fractal physicist and has explained some of the geometry that is underlining all of reality. He's written books, he's invented things. Um, one of the things is Flame in Mind. It's an app that helps you understand your brain and go into um, a, a uh, implosion state. Uh, he's also developed um, Therify, which is a plasma device that also puts your body into a hyper healing state. He's written many books um, and has really grace this earth with one of the most beautiful minds on the planet right now, because he's blending the science and physics of heaven and reality with an, a massive understanding of uh, mystical um, teachings. So welcome, Dan. You know, I almost dedicated my life to you um, in, you know, 10 years ago in Los Angeles, I was a housewife with the newborn and I was so impressed with your work and your websites. I thought, I, I want to dedicate my life to rebuilding your websites for just everyday people that they could really get in there. And your work is, is just really phenomenal. And I'm excited, so excited to have you on today and excited to ask you hopefully some questions that you don't get asked all the time. <laughs> so thank well, you so much. Well, thank, thanks for the kind words. And let's remember, this is not about personalities, and you're very kind. But this is about whether people understand the core principles of science, which empower spirituality, really, which the implosion that happens during Kundalini is a good introduction. So this is a wonderful and appropriate place to start. <laughs> Amazing. So yeah, I, I we're going to talk about sex. We're going to talk about Kundalini. We're going to talk about passion. That's the first part of what I really want to focus on because when we're interviewing these people for the purpose lab, we're realizing that when people find their purpose and their love and joy and compassion, they begin to magnetize the whole world around them as they implode their field and it becomes uh, recursive. So what what happens when someone is living in their purpose? And we you talk about the heart and how it works and how it creates these fields. What what happens when someone is like in their purpose and 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 what are synchronicities? Do they have are you say that love is the only thing that creates in reality? So talk <laughs> a little bit about the heart and synchronicities and living your passion and how that works works mathematically. Well, it, it's true. We showed that the origin of the heartbeat electrically is literally a vortex that turns inside out 
And that implosion, if you do the frequency signature of the EKG, reveals at the moment of love, you have this form of coherence, which is actually implosion, a real heart coherence dot com. But regarding finding your, finding your purpose, I really like the story from our friend Jaz Mahin, who was teaching people to basically live without food, you know, and you need to spend time in nature every day and you need to do all these things in which you're essentially learning to implode and absor absorb charge. Now, one of the interesting things was that one of the things that you needed to be doing a good chunk of every day is you needed to be doing whatever it was that you believed was your highest level of service. And if you were doing that, then you'd be imploding charge and therefore you don't need food. <laughs> well, what does that tell you? <laughs> that the aura is essentially fed by that implosion. So the ability to do a high level of service it empowers your passion. You turn inside out recursively and you become attractive. <laughs> yeah, interesting. What do you think is, what do you think happens when synchronicities happen? Yeah, so what well, we've defined is very specific, you know, excuse me for a moment as an electrical engineer, but we now actually know what time is. Time is a name for when charge rotates and has a period. So charge rotates and that inertia is called mass and charge rotates and the period of the rotation is called time. And so the rate of rotation is when they say time speeds up. It's actually the implosion you get, for example, at the, end, at the center of Kundalini or bliss, the spin density is awareness itself, the Daniel Brinkley phenomena, the surviving lightning bolts, you know, the, the near-death experience. It's all the ability to survive the center of a lightning bolt. Now, as you in, are able to inhabit the center of greater spin, metabolism speeds up, charge density, and information density, and that's the communion, which actually eventually leads to the conversation of Stargate. So in that process, Obviously, if you think an unshareable thought, <laughs> you generate heat and you can't stay at the center. However, if you are able to focus on pure principle at that moment, you can inhabit the center of a lightning bolt. And what we call synchronicity technically is the capacitive coupling, which is enabled when charge rotations superpose. So, for example, when they showed in the Mayan calendar where we that the periodicities in time are actually golden ratio multiples in time in the whole spiral of the Mayan calendar. You can see the graphic at goldenmean.info slash coincidence, where the physics of coincidence is literally the charge coupling enabled by rotation superposed. So if you did the same magic thing on your birthday X number of years later and the rotations overlay, it's actually charge coupling, which is the physics of coincidence, literally embed ability. And so that then leads to a much deeper understanding of what we're calling time is literally rotations that are imploding. So it's almost like you're coupling with, when that synchronicity happens, your wave is coupling with a broader reality? With a bigger, literally a longer wave. They, the reason they call it the next dimension for example, superposing a dodeca around a cube, they call it the next dimension because only golden ratio enables, and that's conjugation, and that enables that implosion. So the only way doorway to the next dimension is the doorway to the superposing the next axis superposed spin symmetry of charge, which shows up in the harmonics of the power spectrum. For example, harmonic inclusiveness in the heart is the measure of immune health. So the more harmonics you can eat, <laughs> literally, measurably, that's how immune healthy you are. So that's an example of synchronicity, that if you relax where spin symmetries are superposed, which is enabled in nature and disabled in metal buildings. Yeah, interesting. So we're going to talk a little bit later about dimensions and, and how they overlap and things like that. But so let's talk about, you talk about when you're grounding, you're locking the phase um, horizontally. Now, yes. I have a grounding mat on my bed and have been experiencing stacking orgasms as like multiple, many, 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 many on top of one another. And is that the same as Kundalini? And what happens, like, can you actually wish things into existence in that moment? How does it work? Well, first of all, the book Earthing is a wonderful example of the physics of grounding 
It is literally the access to charge distribution enabled, which is access to fractality. And grounding has the same meaning for electricians as it does for psychologists. When you're in phase with charge distribution perfected called grounding, that phase relationship allows the implosion inside you to enter into phase with the implosion outside you. Technically, it's a longitudinal array, actually. So the vortex has no place to go at the center, called Planck, unless it's grounded. So at Therify or after Bliss Experience or after Kundalini, anything like that, the, the physics of grounding is essential because it puts your spin in reference to charge distribution enabled. And charge distribution en enabled is a name for what we call heaven or consciousness itself. So if you can't be part of charge distribution enabled, then your bliss is literally going to drive you nuts rather quickly, which is why grounding is essential after bliss, after therify, after kundalini, after lightning experiences. And that's why when you live in a tall building disconnected from Schumann, uh-uh, life in a high rise makes you hungry for something you can't even see, said John Denver. <laughs> So and now with regard to the kundalini biophysics, so if you take that low frequency cascade, which we now know is called the phase conjugate pump wave and is the golden ratio harmonics in the spine liquid pump, which is the only motor of kundalini. And we have a graphic on that at goldenmean.info slash kundalini, graphics I prepared for today, but whatever. So that caduceus cascade imploding needs that center point of ground. And then the lightning bolt can go to completion. And the Kundalini is literally a lightning bolt. Got the low frequencies of the sacrocranial, the low frequencies of the breath, breath, the low frequency of the HRV, and they're all exactly a golden ratio phase conjugate pump wave, you know, <laughs> implosion. And that then drives the golden ratio cascade in the brain waves. And all that enables the implosion down that vortex. And it feels like lightning up your tailbone. It's measurable in the microwave. And we even know the frequency in the microwave, 1.91 angstroms to measure Kundalini at. It's the frequency of adenosine diphosphate triphosphate, which is the most important molecule in the body. So Kundalini radiates in the microwave and we know why. And that's why it affects bird navigations and clouds. I mean, it's important stuff. <laughs> they called it the, in Iceland, they call it the great mass of God. It looks like lightning from a distance. It's very powerful. And it's, it's also very life-threatening and very dangerous, but it is a climax phenomena. Inhabiting lightning bolts is going to be dangerous, but it could be fun. <laughs> so I'd love to see your slides and have you share what you prepared on the Kundalini. But so, but what, what, what can we do in those moments of Kundalini or bliss that improves the outcome of the universe? I mean, like, does it work? often I wish something for, for my community or, or a specific thing to, to grow and flourish. Is that, does that do anything or how does it work? Well, first of all, Kundalini is electrically contagious. I was there when they were drinking Muktananda's bathwater. It actually wasn't very pretty, but, but, uh, but Kundalini is a radiance of plasma, which is nourishing potentially to its environment. It's definitely a rainmaker. Also, if you have a lot of kundalini and you're in an office, it'll generate headaches with a lot of people in the room. It ain't that good because people aren't ready for spin, de spin density. And so bliss is absolutely has critical mass and bliss is absolutely contagious for better or for worse. And so all you're radiating is essentially spin density. Now, if at the center of that spin density, you're able to hold the vision called pure intention of something that's shareable, <laughs> well, then you've served that environment beautifully and your thoughts will radiate. You become a radiator for thoughts, absolutely, for better or for worse. And if you become a radiator for negative thoughts, you know, you're going to blow up faster probably. <laughs> but it's literally, electrically, a test for pure intention, absolutely. And pure intention is literally which wave can be shared, for sure. And that's, and lightning bolts don't last long unless. <laughs> Interesting. So is Kundalini the same as an orgasm or is it well, different in your body? You know, Wilhelm Reich wrote the function of the orgasm and he didn't know, actually. The orgasm has an ultraviolet component which travels up the tailbone and is measurable and is part of the motor for Kundalini delivering a super nutrient into the crown of the brain through the amygdala for sure. And you can measure that phenomenon. And we measured how it drives the spine liquid pump and how it drives 
the liquids of the ventricle cavities. That's all in the graphics. So the raw material for Kundalini absolutely can, in, in many cases, is a big part of the of the juice that drives it is sex sexual energy for sure and that has an ultraviolet component that they say the the sperm travels up the spine minus the tail of the sperm I mean, it's very literal and that's why young people who dissipate their sexual energy too early are less likely to have bliss experience actually on the other hand people who have stuck sexual energy aren't going to do so good either <laughs> But but it's literally because it's the 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 body gathers ultraviolet coherence, it's literally the blue fire, which is literally the sex juice of your body, and it gathers at the tailbone, and sexual exchange can be a very healthy exchange of that ultraviolet blue fire, the plasma. It's sweet, beautiful, wonderful, and under the right circumstances, when pressurized it can go up the tailbone and cause an explosion in the brain, which can be fabulous or it can kill you. <laughs> Absolutely. And it, Wilhelm Reich didn't have a clue when he wrote Function of the Orgasm because he didn't know what, what Kundalini was. So that ultraviolet component that travels up the tailbone can be an extreme nutrient for the brain and it can, can drive rapid growth and flowering. And you know, the crown chakra burns and you feel a negative ion wind and the clouds form. Absolutely. <laughs> and... If you can't develop pure intention in that process, you can drive to perversity very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So so interesting. Would you like to share your slides on Kundalini before we move on to another topic? Okay, well, I just, this is mostly about, um, about the harmonics, the wave mechanics, sort of how it works. Uh, desktop one, huh? It doesn't give me, okay, I'm going to try desktop one. Advanced. Yeah, while he's looking for that, we really, you know, LightNet is really focused right now um, in our purpose lab on this idea, this Joseph Campbell quote, for example, that says that, you know, when you in find your passion and your joy and your purpose in life, doors open up for you that were only walls. So there's something that happens in the act of creating things in the world that 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 people that are they're passionate about what they do actually encounter. And it's it's such a beautiful phenomenon and we want more and more of the world to encounter this layer of synchronicity, this this purpose, this feeling of um deep satisfaction that you're, you know, helping in the in the evolution of the world through your through your love and through your joy, whether yes. that's knitting or or working on fractal phys physics. In, in the, fact, the what you're doing is you're you're inhabiting important. a spin dense environment, which is which is passion, it's ancestor memory, it's pure information, and that spin density is, as we see, we understand a lot more about the physics now, which is basically. A, a musical recipe. Are you seeing my screen here? The golden yes, yes. Oh, good. Okay. So on the top left, you see the known Schumann harmonics. They're golden ratio based, 7.83, 14.20. And that, that golden ratio cascade is reflected directly in the frequencies of the brain wave, alpha, theta, beta, during bliss, and directly in the low frequencies of the sacrocranial pump, the cranial osteo, and the breath frequencies. So there, it's all a golden ratio cascade, which looks like this, a caduceus. And here is a measurement of, in my case, one, two, three, four harmonics in golden ratio in my brain waves, starting here in theta and here in green and alpha. So your brain waves imploding in phase with the spine liquid pump. And here's what's happening. The, the, this is from Bentoff now. This is our measurement with a capacitive accelerometer of the low frequencies of the heart driving the spine liquid pump into the brain liquid cavity, imploding literally, and the ventricle horn liquids here crystallize and you become horny, which is to say the, they, they become plasma projective. This is an implosive, implosive phonon pressure on the pineal, which starts to burn, actually. Here's the, the actual physics. I mean, this if you ever wanted to know the real physics of Kundalini, it is actually here. These are the proven low frequencies of the spine liquid pump, sacrocranial pump, which is the only motor of Kundalini for sure, the beginning where it starts. And the theoretical 
Golden ratio times Planck frequencies, pure implosion, PlanckFire.com are here in red. And in green are the known tidal frequencies of the spine liquid pump, including the famous Mayer wave, 0.1 hertz, 10 second wave, the most important frequency of the breath and the spine liquid in the body. So that cascade looks like a caduceus here, drives the brain waves to implode, and that creates that dynamic cascade. Here's the LF and HF components in the HRV. And just one last quick comment here. If you then measure, oh, this is the frequency cascade, Planck times golden ratio, which tunes all of these things called PlanckFire.com, that charge collapse is the cause of bliss, the cause of gravity, the cause of life, and the cause of consciousness. PlanckFire.com, P-L-A-N-C-K-P-H-I-R-E, PlanckFire.com. That charge collapse is the reason gravity exists, consciousness exists, bliss exists, and life exists. And, and just finally, last picture from this group if we look at that cascade in the spine liquid pump, and then we measured right here, the ringing in the ears heard by meditators, you know, your ancestors are phoning, <laughs> Valerie knows which ancestors calling, by which ears ringing. So we measured the ringing in the ears heard by the meditators, and then calculated the ratio of the frequencies in red by my equation. So the ringing in your ears that you're hearing is actually that phonon wave imploding in the brain liquid, driving the pineal gland to burn, and that's creating an information communion. So the very nature of that intense implosion of plasma, literally charged, literally life, life, that at the center of the plasma implosion, not only is it the very nature of energy density, it is, by definition, the very nature of biologic information density. Your inner voice starts to go fast, your your thoughts begin to go fast. Everything speeds up. And then in my case, I cried for about six months straight as I processed every single emotion of my childhood, which was not shareable. So that weeping process was the process of finding pure principle in everything. So before you go to bed at night, you play your day like it was a movie and you ch check to see where you get distracted. And then you'll know what is not shareable, what has not been distilled into pure principle, and that is what will not go through death. Fascinating. So so maybe in, in a way, you know how everything is nested in a fractal from the individual outward. You know, I often wonder if once we come together, all of us on the planet, or the, the critical number, that we that, and we move up that that um information density as we implode ourselves into the higher states is that maybe we just become a star and that's how we look up and those are other groups of people that have gotten there well that that's very practical in fact every ancient shaman will tell you the heart of the sun is cool and inviting and an eyeball and if you haven't been through the heart of the sun, you didn't grow up. And if you're not a sun god, you're not interesting. Any shaman can tell you that. But what they mean by that is the fact that the plasma density that you're a seed of, for example, when a million children sang the same song 11 times, we measured dramatic effect on the solar flares. What the sun was saying is that the sun needs us to make the centripetal force which makes star birth sustainable. So essentially, once you know why objects fall to the ground, then you can know how to become a sun god because you know the origin of centripetal forces in general. So basically, the what all of the ancient religions were sun god religions for a very specific reason. The most intelligent plasma being in the solar system for sure is the heart of the sun where Osiris went, for example. If you did, if Osiris didn't regulate the solar flares, the Nile wouldn't flood and they'd fire the Pharaoh and they were right to do it. And Tutankhamun inherited the ability to make rain for that reason, actually. So that was the yearning. It's called the willed mutation of the species by Sat Prem. So the yearning to be able to regulate the rainfall, which inhabited hundreds of generations of pharaohs, meant that Tutankhamun was a rainmaker, as it, to some extent am I. I'm not good at it, but actually we do rainmaking rituals often, goldenmean.info slash rain, you'll see how that works. Basically the physics is 
that water vapor is enabled to become a droplet in the presence of the centripetal force called Christos to crystallize. And that's the physics of why most any child can put a hole in a cloud when they're standing in a puddle. <laughs> Interesting. So when, when, um, so one of the things um, we, I, I want to ask you about teleportation and levitation. You're talking about gravity and things like that. So we have set up experiments where, where we have objects in one place um, in an egg container and we have a blank egg container and we have 12 people, four of which are no longer here and the rest of us are here. And we're asking to move objects from one egg container to another egg container as we send objects to the other person. And so I was was told when that, that, that there could be a device that we could create that would create, I don't know if that the both, you know, one egg container over here and one egg has to have to be, you know, entrained to a similar frequency, or maybe, you know, you talk about the mathematics and physics of disappearing. So what do you think about that? How would that work? A very appropriate question does require a little physics background. Remember when we measured Jean-Charles Moyen's brainwaves uh, re uh, just before he teleported with witnesses and came back with sand between his toes? Um, the brainwave signature that identifies is a golden ratio plus octave cascade from alpha to gamma, basically the same caduceus of implosion. Mm -hmm. And that same frequency signature we've been teaching to kids for years, which triggers kids who can see without their eyes, and then directly clairvoyance, they begin to see their ancestors when they can do that. So the alpha to gamma implosion cascade in the brainwaves makes the liquid crystal, the charge vortex inside your head named consciousness inhabiting a nest of fireflies that vortex becomes so coherent you can take it outside your head the physics of lucid dreaming and successful death so the harmonics known in university studies which trigger that lucid dreaming are a golden ratio cascade again of the same series of harmonics they introduce compression in the cascade so how does this relate to your question <laughs> so when that vortex implodes at center it climaxes at the Planck threshold called PlankFire.com, where the transverse EMF inertia is converted, most of our electromagnetic transverse, to a much more coherent and far penetrating called longitudinal EMF coherence, incorrectly called scalar. And the longitudinal component of the EMF wave then propagates into an array. So the longitudinal EMF waves, incorrectly called scalar, will go through most anything, for example, a Faraday cage. When Ingo Swan heated a thermistor, lit a flame with his mind at a distance through a Faraday cage, made the same brainwave series. So the ability to propagate through almost anything requires the longitudinal array, the nodes of the dodecaecosa sacred earth grid. The only place where commercial and military quality telepathy is measurable Cozy rep. So at the nodes of the longitudinal array, you get that successful compression and the billiard balls at the center of that compression line up and bounce around into that array. Now, if there's extreme compression into that array, the nodes offer a delivery system, which is the only physics of any action at a distance anywhere, <laughs> which is a longitudinal coherent EMF array. And if enough inertia is delivered with coherence into the longitudinal compression node, there's a distribution enabled. But look out, <laughs> too much too much uh, portal travel will scramble your soul. Absolutely. There are limitations. There are hygiene issues. There are many issues. But for starters, if you'd like to learn about it, you probably learn, need to learn where the longitudinal array nodes are. Like you need to be able to douse where the magnetic lines cross because there you have a chance. And now that will also, that is the physics of all action at distance of any kind. So, for example, when we do healing at a distance with therophyte.net plasma. We know it works better if sender and receiver are at a magnetic grid cross point node. We know it works better at sunrise and sunset or uh, equinox solstice. And we know the physics because that's where the perpendicularity enables longitudinal propagation, the physics of Agni Hotra, for example. So, the ability to achieve action at a distance starts with understanding the compression physics of sacred space, in summary. So, can you? 
and maybe people governments have tried can you create those those there's those, all and that's what stargates are that's yeah, what a portal stargate, is yeah that, yeah, that's yeah. why they use the Ophain and Minokian alphabet to make the movie Stargate. You yeah. arrange the toroids to implode, compress, and you get a portal. You literally a liquid array, which was experienced as a lucid dream inside a dodeca by Jodie Foster in contact for a very good reason. Yeah. <laughs> lucid dreaming is an introduction to the ability to propagate coherently in the array. And then when you learn to steer a group in a lucid dream, then you're beginning to grow up. So we're working at LightNet on lucid living, and I think that it's possible to for us to to have a similar experience in waking life. Uh, and 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 we've been doing tests on this, um, which we call blooms, and we bloom, you know, ridiculous things into reality using a group coherence um, nice. and that sort of mindset. So. I was going to ask you about the blindfold because it is really incredible for those of you listening. There's people that can actually walk into supermarkets, pick exact things off the shelf. They can even drive their motorcycle and they're legally blind. But so are they in, so there's people that can do it in a sustained, sustained mm -hmm. way. Are you saying that they're in alpha or that they're in alpha going to to gamma and are they staying in gamma or is it what exactly is it well you know we've studied the um the kids seeing without their eyes phenomena for many years so we're quite knowledgeable on that uh, we, i would caution be very careful because kids get confused it is possible to see with pinhole vision through a little hole in the blindfold and that confuses many people yet truly blindfolded this phenomenon is very real and the physics is very simple, actually. The physics that you learn to prehend the compression nodes of a longitudinal array, which actually is the physics of all vision, actually. So that's why when people get into a longitudinal node like Therify.net, 30% of them experience a sharpening of vision. Vision actually is the implosion of the central node. Now, when you can prehend the longitudinal component of that array, it, you know, the people say next dimension and astral body. These are crappy terms. Electrical engineers need much more precise terms. It's the coherence of embedding into the longitudinal array. That is the physics of clairvoyance and lucid dream. It's very specific. And it means, for example, is it ain't going to last long if you're in a metal building full of electrosmog and dead everything. No. If you're in nature where compression lines are enabled, then you got a shot at it. So the hygiene to have a charge dense diet and environment is step one. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is really apropos. So LightNet is based in Sedona. And I think that if we can understand, I mean, there's shoes you can wear that help you ground. There's these grounding mats for your bed. Um, I now remember all my dreams with the grounding mat. I mean, it's interesting. Nice. So there's something. Yeah. And I think that we can really over well i think coming together will enable us to unlock some of these things um that 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 we haven't been before and we're working with the biocybernaut institute too to work on shared biofeedback where we can share alpha together and exactly and that's a beautiful thing which lucid dreaming as a group we have our lucid dream team.com a lecture in two weeks on fractal u.com on how collective lucid dreaming work but yes and i would suggest even a step one uh people need to learn basic dousing because if you can't feel a magnetic line cross ultimately you can't feel and magnetic line crosses is your map to the collective mind you know yeah. So dousing 101, and you'll notice the more bliss you have access to, the greater your dousing sensitivity. And that's where you hear, hear the voice of the earth. It's real. Now, one of, um, so coffee in our team, LightNet team is working on interviewing people who have levitated. We have a levitation lab where we're tracking how people do that. And um, one of the things that is coming through a lot is help from the other side, another dimension. Um, but so teleportation and levitation would be different because you're actually not leaving fully. You're, you're Mac, you're imploding, but you're, well, anyway, what are your thoughts with that? And have you known any levitators or are you interested? Yeah, sure. Yeah. sure. 
you know, when we taught at TM centers under gold domes around the world, it's nice to know why levitation is more likely under a gold dome. We teach the physics. But it starts, actually, this cannot be taught to scientists who don't have a clue why objects fall to the ground. So step one is to learn why objects fall to the ground, actually. And that is when the charge, for example, in the center of hydrogen implodes, it propagates with directional propagation into the longitudinal array, EMF, which, as Bearden defined, is the definition of what a gravity wave is made of. So basically, spitting out longitudinal EMF coherently and directionally is the origin of gravity, as what happens in the center of hydrogen. I wrote the equation. So after you learn why objects fall to the ground, then you can learn how to float. <laughs> so so the, the ability to implode and then make the longitudinal propagation directional. If you study the water vortex from Victor Schauberger that spontaneously got colder just before you started making voltage from gravity, and then he put it in a repulsine and he made gravity. Now we measured the amount of, so the vortex angle has to be such that the trans, it's called translation of, vor, of, of vorticity, translation of an inertia, from transverse to directional longitudinal compressional in one direction. So the angle of the vortex is such that uh, at the nose of the, of the tip of that cone, the longitudinal EMF is propagating coherently and directionally. For example, the mercury vortex doped with iron powder that became the Hanbu Nazi Bell Vimana. So if you know how a vortex can make gravity, you begin to understand what it is to pay your debt to gravity, which is to flow. You literally become more fractal than the earth underneath you, which is very, very common in bliss experience. People who float, people have bliss experience. Floating is very, very common, actually. And to understand that physics is very instructive. Not that the city, well, that's what we call it a city. Not that the city itself is a goal. No, the goal is not to float. The goal is to understand the physics well enough to do it in an empowered way. And eventually you can navigate in the dream, which is perhaps even more important. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And I think we can take that down into this life and through through finding your passion, your bliss. You know, you literally are yeah. floating. There is ease and grace to your life. The the things just tend to work out. So um, I wanted to ask you, one of the research projects we're doing is we're using Jimmy Blanchett's um, math where he takes Planck length, divides it by 432. And he's come up with this 144 radio frequency and we've been able to talk to the other side using this frequency on 30, you know, um, different ham radios. So they're all making different noises. So the beings that are using them, past loved ones, ETs and guides are able to isolate one versus the other. And we're able to do a yes, no, um, back and forth with them. We have different codes. So one beep is yes, two beeps is no, four beeps is clapping. And I was wondering, you know, you talk a lot about this telephone to, you know, to having a telephone to the other side. What do you think about this research? And, and do you think... Yeah, I mean, we're, we we seem to be using some sort of an agreement field between the other side. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I would say um, the 432 is an oversimplification. You can read the more detail, fractalfield.com slash implosion sound. Radio communication with the dead has been around for 30 or 40 years. It's called ITC. I knew the people in, in Florida, George Meek, actually, who, who originally did the original work on that. And, We've been in touch with those people for many years. Radio communication with the dead is very real, but the physics is absolutely Planck times integer exponents of golden ratio and everything else is a crude uh, approximation because that's how you create the longitudinal array access by phase conjugation to Planck. And that is the <laughs> that is the nodes of the longitudinal array. Uh, and, you know, the, the Kozirev mirror or the, the Aztec mirror or the black obsidian mirror of the... Olmec, these were devices to phase conjugate and they got, you know, ancestor communication, absolutely. So we know the frequency signature and 432 really ain't it. But there is an implosion sound that can facilitate that. Actually, 
perfected. It's called Flame and Sound is the name of the app on the App Store, and it's the ultimate binaural bliss audio trigger, but it is also the frequencies of the brain waves that trigger. So all of those frequency approximations do one thing and one thing only. They implode into compression into the Planck-tuned longitudinal array, and that is ancestor memory. That is the lucid dream, and that is the that's incorrectly called the astral plane. It is an array of longitudinal nodes which is pure physics and pure electrical engineering, and we should use much more precise language when we talk about it. For example, dreaming track song line. These are all names for a coherent longitudinal array, for sure. Interesting. So yeah, I hope I didn't misquote or misrepresent Jim, Jimmy's research because it's a little bit more complicated how he he does the math um, with the equation. But what what is your understanding of the number 144? whether it's in lore and um, mysticism, or it seems to be an important number in his research. Uh, you know, 144 was used as uh, 12 squared because it was the geometry of a, a cubic array. And a cubic array is the opposite of implosion, actually, actually, perfect for crystallization and the opposite of implosion. So the real issue is that an octave series, which is what 144 is part of and points to, an octave series will create maximum destructive wave interference, which is perfect for hex, for crystallizing, for stabilizing, but is the opposite for implosion and is the opposite of communication, actually. So the opposite of that is a golden ratio cascade, which always ultimately will start with Planck, called PlankFire.com, the cause of gravity and consciousness. And when you combine the two, like in the brain waves that we have measured, creating this lucid dreaming and kids who see the you have alpha to gamma cascade, eight up to 44 hertz. And that cascade has both golden ratio and octave in the cascade, so the latter. So what happens is the tetracubic array, which you're calling 144, which is basically an octave series, creates the ability to stabilize, which is essential. You start there, you start with hex. And then after the hex is stabilized, then the, the golden ratio cascade can be superposed on it, which is exactly what happens when you rotate a cube into a pentodeca by blinking five times. So superposing golden ratio around an, an octave cascade enables the stable skeleton of the octave cascade, literally hex, crystallization perfected. And that then implosion is superposed over that by golden ratio. The where that's symbolized in the ancient literature extensively, perhaps most, is when all of the clairvoyants saw the heart of the sun, the heart of the human, and the heart of the hydrogen, later proven in physics to be correct as seven spins outside, five spins inside. The seven spins is tetracubic, the five spins is pent implosion. So that particular slipknot, seven over five, which they named Anu, which is literally the heart of the sun, the heart of the human, and the heart of the hydrogen. It's the same exact slipknot. It's the place where you can superpose the seven spins, tetracubic, with the five spins, pent. And, and when that happens, it's literally pentodeca superposed around a tetracube. And so the argument is never, you know, is octave evil and golden ratio is good? No, no. The nature uses tetracubic octave symmetries for very specific reasons. Snowflakes are very stable. <laughs> then once you've got the stability, then you implode and superpose the pent. And then, then the slipknot is perfect. It's called Anu, the heart of the sun. And if you ain't the heart of the sun, every ancient religion tells you you're boring. <laughs> so when we were talking to Dr. Simeon Hine, he was talking about how crop circles that were in the golden ratio and would break equipment more frequently than those that were not. But we also came to the question that if, that there are some people that can reach other dimensions very easily, um, and that they're actually able to put their mind, their um, frame of reference in something that's not based on the geometry of earth but based on another geometry and mm. so 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 it's almost like they're braiding into another dimension that has a core geometry that's different than ours here um i would regard that concept as schizophrenic 
Uh, Planck is universal, absolutely. What we mean by other dimensions is always the ability to access a superposed node of plasma rotation. So in the same way that kids start to see their ancestors when they learn golden ratio and brain waves, they have gone to the next dimension, a very crude way to name it, uh, they're able to superpose the plasma nodes and perceive. So they can demodulate inside the longitudinal coherent node and see the ancestor memory as an array. Now, is that separate? Absolutely not. Is it based on a separate harmonic series? Absolutely not. There is no separation. So the ability to propagate to other nodes in the array is always the same physics, the same harmonic series, the same Planck and golden ratio basis. There is no separation. And so these higher dimensions are real, but they're absolutely plasma superposed rotations and they're based on phase conjugation. They all start with Planck and golden ratio. Interesting. So, so do you believe that um, ETs and beings are superimposed in our reality. Can they see us? They can see us right now. They can stand next to us right now. Um, in the same way that people who become clairvoyant see the ghosts in the room, it's very analogous. So they're seeing a weaker compression in the plasma node that requires the ability to prehend a larger portion of the longitudinal component of that array, which requires a higher form of coherence. Now, if you sat still in a sacred forest for a day or two, <laughs> you'd probably be able to see them too. <laughs> right. Simple well, so physics. What, but, but what about the other dimensions and densities? Do you think that ETs or ultra dimensionals or whatever are in um, dimensions that are even deeper? Oh, sure. I, you know, when we say higher density, we mean one and one specific thing only where more axes of spin have been superposed. Obviously, you can only superpose more than three using golden ratio, actually, phase conjugation. And when you get that, that higher level of density, for example, the, the Orion Wars were fought for I don't know how many billion years because in the trapezium cube in Orion was the biggest stargate in this galaxy. Why was that stargate there? Because the tetracubic lattice structure enabled greater compression into a larger harmonic series of compression so you could reach longitudinal nodes with more harmonics contained and you could you know that stargate was kick-ass man it was worth having a galaxy war over the access to the doorway <laughs> well that is compression physics and it's the same physics of compression we start with when you learn how to find a sacred node in your house by dousing for where your altar should be <laughs> interesting so I was going to ask you this later, but let's let's ask this, um, and then I want to ask you how you would spend a million dollars. But let me let me ask you: Was there was does aliens have anything to do, or did aliens have anything to do with nine eleven? I think it's a pretty complicated question. You know, I've been doing lectures with Elena Danan now for many years, and I think uh, on the social level, she's very correct, and her ET history is good. I started with Anton Parks, but Elena is really more up to date on that. And so we know a lot of this physics. The central ET physics of this planet, the central story, is the fact that the guy at the heart of the Jewish religion, called N. Yahweh, was actually Enlil, who was half Draco. That is the problem. That is the biggest problem of this planet, actually. And so that controversy so for so many years created a, an astral hygiene nightmare. Now, recently, the Dracos have been driven out of the solar system, as have the Greys, the Nebu. But, you know, you get the tick out of your arm and you still got a problem. <laughs> and uh, and I, I'm not going to indulge in the speculations on the 9 -11. I think there is absolutely a nasty conspiracy behind 9-11 for sure. And I think there's a nasty conspiracy behind much of religious history on this planet, absolutely. And I think step one to understand religious history is to understand which ET was named who. We know which ET was named Yahweh and which was named Allah. And these were not the good guys. Hello. <laughs> and the problem is recognizing that humans from the time when the Anunnaki needed gold mining slaves have been of a slave mentality for how many thousand years? And the only, the only actual way out of that, and you're on the right track here, it, it, the way out of that is not to figure out which conspiracy theory is right. No, that's a rat, rotten wormhole and it's boring. No, the only way out of that is if you, 
can make your own bliss experience, suddenly you're imploding, now you got leverage. Until then, you are by definition a parasite because you can't make your own charge. Yes, I agree. I agree. I think it's so important for us to come together and use our energy in order to create all these things that are next. So um, how, what would you do? One of the things we're working on is a dream machine where we we look at prototypes that want to be invented in the world and we focus on bringing about the necessary resources and to do them. So what would you do with a million dollars and what would you do with $10 million? <laughs> well, first of all, we're highly opinionated about what a dream machine is. <laughs> After, after the university published studies, which of what frequencies triggered lucid dreaming fit my equation, plonkfire.com, which we use for therify.net, which replicably triggers lucid dreams. So we know exactly what triggers a real dream is. Your aura implodes and you propagate in the longitudinal array. There's nothing dreamy about the physics of a dream machine. <laughs> dream machine is well-recognized electrical engineering. Thank you very much. Yeah, what I, I would do with... What what I would do with piles of money, <laughs> look, we're, I am happy and successful. You know, we got 3 million views, Dan Winter Fractal Field on YouTube, is 400 films, we got 20 different websites, we got eight different energy projects, implosiongroup.com, flameandmind.com, therify.net, and a whole bunch more, and now piezofire.com. You know, we're, we're having a whole lot of fun, and we actually, obviously it's a secret, but we're doing economically, we're great. <laughs> it ain't a problem. But our dream, it's clear. We know, here's my passion. You want to know what my passion is? I'll tell you right now. My passion is... We know in biofeedback, you can take the brain waves, and if you properly can teach the kids how to make alpha and gamma in their own brain waves, give them these subtle little audio cues, and suddenly they're making alpha to gamma. And then all of the fun stuff's happening. They get bliss, they get implosion, they get lucid dreaming, they get clairvoyance. All the good stuff happens after the kids learn to make alpha to gamma cascade in the brainwave. I want to teach millions of children how to make alpha to gamma in their brainwaves because that's fun. That's how they're going to become sun gods. And we're well on track. We're improving the software, flameandmind.com. We're improving the audio cues. And yes, we're looking to buy a big place with the foundations here, all kinds of fun, to teach kids to make a flame in their mind. So that's what I would do with it. And I'm already doing it and we're on the track. But yes. <laughs> Yeah, I was um, hoping you would would answer that because I was very interested in your your work with children and trees and compassion and peace. Can you tell exactly. people a little bit about that project? Well, it started at peaceuniversity.net. And I was working with Professor Phil Callahan famously, who had showed that if you measured the, the soil paramagnetism, if the soil is conducting magnetism, then the next village down the the Amazon were friendly. But if the soil would not conduct magnetism, then the next village down the river are going to be headhunters. And what he extrapolated that to was the physics of peaceuniversity.net, which is village A ain't going to make war on village B if magnetism is connecting them. Hello. And that we actually measured Kosovo and, and uh, Ireland, Yugoslavia, that the underground magnetism and therefore the underground water disappears in the presence of war because the magnetic magnetic array breaks. So if you restore the magnetic array, which brings the rain back and, and then village Bay, A is starting to feel the emotions of village B, this became implosion. That centripetal neg entropy is the physics. And I do mean the physics of all peacemaking. Peacemaking in brainwaves, peacemaking in your heart, peacemaking in the magnetic. The name for peace is the same as Origin of Negentropy, the title of my second last book. So that's called peaceuniversity.net. And that is a curriculum to teach peace based on the fact that when waves become centripetal, it's a definition of all peacemaking, including Israel. <laughs> Yeah, wouldn't that be amazing? I, I feel like we can see that in our lifetime. And I feel like if we we can come together to make that happen, the, the science is there and the, the will is there. So it's really exciting to be in this time. So um, 
let me just look over my notes here. Um, I wanted to ask you why goosebumps happen. And everyone, if you have questions, we'll be opening up to Q&A soon. So gather your thoughts together. Um, if you're tuning in online, you can go to lightnet.org slash unlimited as well. Uh, you know, you promised to have fun questions and that's a fun one. <laughs> well, you know, originally anthropologists studied, you know, why your hair stands up. And they said, this is what they said. They said, if a bear is attacking your hair stands up because you need to look bigger. That's that's the anthropology. But I say they just didn't begin to scratch the surface. No, the reason your hair stands up when you have a eureka moment is because you just imploded capacitance called chi. <laughs> chi or going baraka shakti pot. So that implosion defining eureka moment. So when you think a shareable thought and your hair stands up from eureka, it ain't because, you know, a bear's attacking. No, it's because your aura is imploding electrically. And those hairs are some of the best capacitors on your body. In fact, the giant hair-shaped uh, aura shape of giant cathedrals called a, a, a etheric temple, they look like a hair follicle because the earth itself has giant hair follicles for the same reason. Very cool. I, I love that. And it, it happens to me quite often. And it's, it's, it's so, it's so wonderful. It's so wonderful. It means so, you just tripped over a shareable wave. A oh, pyramid. That's so cool. And, that's so and, cool. And yeah. All, all of the charge of the universe is so intelligent that at the moment you think a shareable thought, all the waves of the universe want to jump into you. Yeah, it's almost like it seems to me when someone says something that some people call it truth bumps, even yeah, when that happens. So it's good. like, yes, exactly. I agree. I feel that. I, I know that to be true. It's, it's a thought that can serve the survival of ancestor memory for a billion years. It is literally pure principle. And only that goes through death. Hmm. So... Let's talk about death. You often talk about how important it is not to be in a hospital if possible and to be and to 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 drive your um you know your cocoon and your vortex in the right way. What are you hoping when you cross over happens? And what do you think is yeah, what do you think happens? Well, I'm not saying hospitals are all evil, but I am saying the altar at Machu Picchu would be good. <laughs> what, what, what I mean is that where magnetic lines cross, you have access to the collective DNA radio. You know, as I have said many times, you inhabit an array now. It's called your synapses. When you die, if you want to contain memory, you must inhabit coherently and centripetally a much larger array. So that's why when, you know, there's an auto accident and somebody died in the woods, you take a picture. Often you can see the ghost leaving. But if somebody dies in a hospital, you take a picture, you don't see the ghost leaving. Why? <laughs> because it's an electrosmog scramble. That's why. It's the opposite of successful death. So if we understood what death was, which was the opposite uh, opportunity to jump into a larger array, we would prepare a doorway into that array, which is the physics of successful death. And it ain't electrosmog and metal buildings. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, I do feel strongly about that. Not that, and so practice lucid dreaming is obviously ideal. And I, you know, I teach the physics of lucid dreaming some, but I'm not saying I'm that good at it. I'm working at it. Well, so, but why do you want to retain your memories after death? And what, why do what, why is it important to learn lucid dreaming? Consciousness itself is a name for the principle of continuity of memory. Mm -hmm. Any any discontinuity in memory is by definition the opposite of consciousness. For example, you had a trauma as a kid and you left your body and so there's a hole in your memory. That is a hole in your consciousness. And until you go back and fill up that hole, your aura is leaking. So continuity of memory is everything, absolutely. And if you if we understood anything about consciousness, you understand why taking memory through death is a good thing. Now, obviously, 
nature arranges that you forget most of your past life because most of it's crap anyway. Only a few things about your past life actually serve immortality. But those few, few pure principles of your last life. Let me give you a short example. So Vincent Bridges believed I was John D in a past life. I think I got a little fragment of the soul memory. Now, John D was studying how to use scintillation, literally sparkles in light to communicate with spirits. Now we understand that in the camera obscura, that focus point between the two vortex of light creates that scintillation, which is the compression node of the longitudinal array, which is the physics of communicating with spirit. So, you know, John D was studying astrology, which I think now is mostly boring, but he understood, a few, he had some yearning, which did put some of the wind in my sails. And everything about that, which is sustainable is pure, 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 pure principle. And nothing about that is personality worship. So you're saying that, because because that was my thought is like, well, we really need to understand our past lives by learning how to regress ourselves and learning how to or learning how to mm. channel information and whatever. So, and it is depressing that we come, we forget everything, and we're we've got to figure out how to pass on this wisdom in a single lifetime in order for us to collectively reach this state of Absolutely. wisdom and completion. So. But you're saying so it's important for us to 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 complete as much of our memory and our trauma so that we have the cocoon very like you you guys, those of you who are listening, you can look at a bio well and you can actually see holes in people's sure. biofield. And it is, yeah, it is some trauma and things like that. So, so if we take our memories out, are you thinking that we could then bring them back in again if we reincarnate or what's your thought? Do you want to reincarnate? Do you want to become part of a greater collective mind? How, what do you think happens? Yeah, you know, certain religions advertise, you know, we can save you the need to reincarnate. Well, that itself in itself isn't much of the goal. And evolution is the goal, and evolution is that the consciousness becomes larger and larger. The field effects becomes more contiguous, and eventually there's alchemy inside. Your body becomes immortal, as Ea and Anu have, and that alchemy is that same implosion, non-destructive oppression, and that defines evolution because then the vortex inside is more powerful. You can actually measure it that you know, the vice-like grip you feel with a mind meld with him, Ryan Queen, that centripetal force is a measure of how consciousness you are. And that's a measure of how big the tornado you can steer. And that defines the evolution of consciousness as the ability to inhabit bigger and bigger vortex and eventually stars. And that's called growing up. And it's a very essential physics. And it is, by definition, continuity of memory. Yes, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah, it's ancestor memory for us to stack our wisdom and actually get there. You know, get to the to the moment. Aboriginals called ancestor memory God. That's what's their name for God is ancestor. And ancestor memory is the name for how long is your memory. Well, what does that mean? The bigger the field you inhabit, the longer wave, <laughs> ride the long wave, Uncle Joe, that's evolution of consciousness. That means if there's big chunks of your memory that got holes in it, you know, you better go find the holes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the world is coming together right now with your work and other people's work where the greater mass of people are starting to understand the ancient wisdoms that you know that were once secret and you know hidden from from everyday people which which yeah. are the people that can help propagate it <laughs> and graham hancock is saying you know we're a race with amnesia but at the same time he gets the same moment in each history story and says well quetzalcoatl veracoca somebody came to re bring back the ancient and every time he stops when he gets to et why he's got He's got, you know, loss of memory because he completely ignores the ET history. So until we get the ET history of our gene pool, the Anunnaki, the Draco, who was interfering with our, you know, we, we need that picture. Fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood, the ET history I've been narrating for many years. And it's really quite simple. The genetics of Earth had the capability for more bliss. The red blood here was a shock to Enki Ea 
when he was cooking up the DNA because we could handle more bliss because we had iron blaze. He had only seen chlorophyll based blood, green blood to red blood. And that difference meant our Kundalini could steer bigger stars. The potential here, amazing. But the ability to hold more lightning inside, <laughs> that's bliss physics. And that is the opposite of the hygiene in most cities today. People do not have any chance at bliss with a bad diet and bad environment. So it's hygiene. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, I met a man once with a very high iron content in his blood, and but I heard it's also dangerous to take iron supplements and things. Or, or, or am I getting it wrong? So what what is that in the blood that you were just talking about being important for us to galvanize well, the, the field better? The the biological history apparently is that uh, during the when the humans had to go underground originally, blood was chlorophyll based, and then um, underground uh, lack of access to sun, they uh, it became iron based instead of chlorophyll, and the blood changed from green to red. You know the only difference between a chlorophyll and a hemoglobin, <laughs> heme is one one little atom. I think it's magnesium, uh, but so plugging that iron in the blood meant. Uh, the iron to oxygen bond is one of the most powerful. It's literally, it's the, it's a lightning arrow. And so that's where the word Adam came from, red man, uh, Takadama, but also in the Skanda, Scandinavia, Asaka'an, Scandinavia, that route. It all came because, you know, who had the reddest blood could get more lightning into the blood and therefore steer bigger tornadoes. And that's one of the original fascinations, which made Enki decide we were worth messing with, actually, when they took 22 different ET species and hooked up, they called it Adam Cadmon, long story. So they were cooking up the capability to hold more bliss, and that genetic diversity, you know, hold more bliss with iron. And now, uh, you know, the ability to hold iron in the blood is limited by oxygen solubility, and oxygen solubility is related to charge so I remember my mother who, you know, really kind of died of arthritis because she couldn't hold mineral in solution in her blood while she was sugar addicted. But uh, it, it's, if you don't have bliss experience, you can't hold mineral in solution in the blood. <laughs> so the mineral starts to fall out of your blood until you have bliss. Hello. You know, another dimension to arthritis. Hello. Do you have bliss? So this is the idea that basically iron is holding the lightning bolt and iron poor blood and uh, the whole, uh, you know, uh, the chemistry of blood history all relates to the fact that that red blood became, in, in among the stars, uh, gen, uh, genetics, of those who can hold bliss and therefore lucid dream is a turning point. Yeah, so what let's talk about lucid dreaming. And I'm also going to open this up to any final questions. Um, so why do you think it's important that people lucid dream? And do you think it's possible to waking lucid dream in this life here? Absolutely. Waking lucid dreaming is a fabulous, wonderful thing. And we started by measuring very few people can make alpha with their eyes open. Yes. But those who can, oh, yeah. oh, oh yes. your brain waves are imploding, your steering longitudinal array, and your eyes are still open. Very cool. <laughs> so, yes, you're inhabiting the array, and you're you have more harmonics imploding at your node, <laughs> and you can steer bigger tornadoes and longer waves. So, yes, uh, ability to lucid dream, it's basic. If you can't lucid dream, probably you will not take much memory through death. It's very simple physics because. We now know exactly what a lucid dream is. You propagate coherently into the longitudinal array, ancestor memory, songline, dreaming track, and that ability to maintain coherence into the attention where you literally see into that array. You close your eyes at a sacred site and you see pictures. Why? Well, that is the array inhabiting your node. If you get good at that, then you'll take memory through death because you'll inhabit a bigger array than your synapses. So yes, it's important. So it's almost, I think of it like, you know, in a computer, it's like the ability to write instead of just read. So in a normal dream, you're, the dream is happening around you. It's happening to you. In a lucid dream, you become aware you're dreaming and you can actually do things and cause things and create things. And so I think that's 
the moment that we're in right now as a civilization is we're realizing that our thoughts, feelings, and emotions and passion and hearts are what can cause this creational burst of creating this world that we want instead of being stuck with a world that's at war and this and that and whatever. So this is literally our ability to waking waking lucid dream is our yes. ability to change the course of reality by creating with love into the field the world around us that's so beautifully said too and it does remind me you know where when so many of the the negative ets abducted humans by the millions the grays most 90 percent had some indigenous blood because they were the lucid dreamers why were the lucid dreamers because indigenous peoples lived barefoot on the same land for a thousand years and therefore their dna became phase coherent they had access to bliss so why did they need the lucid dreamers <laughs> is that the only dna that has value Yes, actually, because it's the only DNA that's phase coherent enough to steer a tornado with the origin of psychokinesis, the origin of ensoulment. So until we can teach, I've been saying this for so many years, now, but until we can teach the electrical engineering of what is ensoulment, we're going to have all the wrong laws. Almost every law we have on the books is designed to prevent children from having a soul because your local electrical engineer doesn't know what a soul is. A soul is when that implosion, access to bliss, enables your DNA and your glands to radiate coherent longitudinal. And that is the stuff, not just of gravity waves, but the stuff that goes through death. And that's what matters. So, you know, I've said uh, how many thousand times too, the, the word politics comes from body polis. The polis body is literally the bliss cocoon aura, which becomes navigable, like when a beehive swarms, if there's royal blood present, to steer. So unless you have a collective bliss cocoon, biologically, you do not have politics. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you can't steer. Yeah. So when I was at the Biosabritan Institute training with Jim Hart, um, I believe that I was able to, and I need to go look back at the data because it was sort of like an off, off road, what little experiment we did. Um, but I believe that I was able to achieve eyes open alpha by listening to music, writing a love letter and sending an email to LightNet members. So it was like, I think that music is something that, and, and, and love letter. I mean, it's. It, I love that story. That's wonderful. <laughs> Congratulations. Perfect. Excellent example. You were following your bliss, dear. Right on. Bingo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know that all of you listening, it's very important to encourage each other to be ourselves and to find our passion and encourage us to, to, you know, we shut down our dreams as children, you know, but really when you're living your dream of what you, your heart's longing, that is something that we can probably share with each other too because it, it's contagious among us even if our dreams are different you know or, or overlapping even but two but it's it's that longitudinal wave will tie us and bring us you know yes all, all it's the so well said up. and and such is the tragedy that instead of that we're teaching kids today to dream of the best ai oh shit that is the opposite of ensoulment. Souls will never inhabit a metal machine. No. So until just what you just said becomes the collective dream of kids, we're in trouble. Because for now, the kids are being taught, oh, the dream of the future is AI. Oh, shit. No, that's the loss of soul. Oops. Yeah. 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 We we, we need to get your Jedi schools uh, yeah. online. and, exactly. uh, and out Jedi school.science. The website's up. It's very, <laughs> exactly. very beautiful. Very, very beautiful. So I open it up to any questions before we close. If there's anyone, you can go ahead and raise your, your hand. Um, if, if not, um, what would be your, Dan, what would be your best case scenario for ET contact in the physical? Like in the coming years, what would be your 
your dream of how you would want things to go as we expand into other galaxies or no other species or or have these dimensions come together? Well, I've had some telepathic communication with the Andromedans, Phaseus, and the Galactic Federation work with Elena Danan. Uh, you know, we think we understand the political situation rather well. Uh, my personal study is the history of Thoth Ningashida Hermes, uh, who was the alchemy teacher behind Ea, Ea Osiris Enki, actually. And that is the physics, you know, the caduceus, the physics of the origin of life force and consciousness being that implosion. So my dream is to perfect that teaching of the pure principle of implosion. For example, tomorrow's class at fractalu.com is the physics of how pyramidwirelesspower.com works, which then is the physics of how Atlantean fire crystals that work work. But actually what that leads to is the physics of what bliss electrically does to your DNA and glands enables that vortex to become implosive and navigable, literally, like you said, the bliss cocoon. So the reason for teaching all this electrical engineering of cosmic stuff, pyramid wireless power and Atlantean fire crystals is just so people can actually understand what's happening in their own DNA and their glands when they have access to bliss. That's the real upstart of the story. And, uh, you know, that's that's my part. And so I, that was Thoth Hermes Ningashida's project. And that's called the Caduceus. And that is my work. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, um, uh, Linda Moulton Howe often says that she hopes that we'll someday understand that we are the children of ETs in a way, right? So all all these different strings and 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 so as we understand our our place and how we were created um we understand also our our potential and i think that um i hope that we do realize something really beautiful because we are all coming together if we're like a cauldron of of different races hoping for something new to be born or or even an accident um i i really i really hope that we reach our potential and um thank you for so for everything that you've brought into this this field to understand the fabric and geometry of heaven and reality so you know, it's it's been so much fun. Your, your questions are so wonderful. And your enthusiasm, your own bliss is so contagious. It's all fabulous. One just little closing thought. You know, among all of the ETs, we know tens of thousands of humanoid species in this galactic sector alone. And one of the reasons they're so interested in Earth is because there's so incredible much creativity here. Originality is off the charts on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Sophia, we'll take your one question before we close, but I need you to turn on your camera. Hi. Okay, thank you. Hi. Okay, so I naturally like see uh, visions or down what I call visions or downloads, um, and they happen a lot in, I think it's called hyp hypnagogic state. Mm -hmm. Nice. And it's been going on for years and it's been like, like healing, like what's been healing me. And then um, a lot of them are like uh, symbolic and uh, not all, but it just feels like I'm tapping into, into something um, and something is giving me, feeding me this way, but then I get obsessed with like painting them because I paint. Uh, I'm an artist, but then I'm also kind of like been really lazy when it comes to like being more proactive and like meditating or like doing practical steps. Like this is how you lose a dream or this is how you do this. This is how you do that. It's kind of like, I just have to, like allow like i have to be more on that receptive yin side of like receiving visions well, that, that's so so nice uh, and and lovely that you're aware that the hypnagogic visions are actually helping you navigate and it's also really true that as you learn 
to share what you've been inspired of, drawing, painting, painting, beautiful, that the, the very process of making that shareable is what gives you permission to have the next beautiful experience, you know? So you're on yeah. the track, you're making that shareable. And yes, what we are here saying is we can understand the physics. If you, for example, if you are aware of where this happened each time, you would realize there's a, a map here to, to sacred space and you realize when it happens here, there's a map. So there's principles behind all of this, but you're doing that intuitively. It sounds you're, like you're on a wonderful track. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's just uh, like I, I like I wish I could be more like in control of it. And also, um, like it can get overwhelming too. It can be like too much. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then I can I have to like take a break uh, as but best as I can. So it, that's a, another aspect. Like try try even setting your in attention each time before you sleep. And then the next dream becomes more steerable. So dis discipline and setting and attention just before sleep might help help make that navigable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Ni nice to meet you, dear. Thank you for your beautiful yeah, question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, awesome. And we appreciate your visions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bringing, bringing these dream states into your life with art and things like that is so important. So exactly. in closing, um, next month or um, in April this month, uh, we're going to be working with Jim Jimmy Blanchett doing a CE5 and also talking about his technology. And um, since we've been talking about a lot about waking dreaming, um, we are going to be leading a research team at the Starseed Academy uh, in July with Adam Kupel, who's going to be teaching waking induced lucid dreaming. So we invite you to join, uh, join that. I've shared the links for, um, Dan's work in the chat and, you know, he's very generous about, um, his research and his books and his university university. So I really encourage you guys to get in there and understand this and bring this down into your lives because, uh, his ideas can can spread, and and I'm I, I'm also a big fan of Thoth, so I think uh, <laughs> if we if we can follow his lead, we'll really pull something beautiful through in our <laughs> lifetime. So thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. This has been a dream, and uh, it is about Thoth. We did a history of Thoth a couple of weeks ago at FractalU.com, but in two weeks, our LucidDreamTeam.com is the theme at FractalU.com, too, so we need to get together on this. More fun to come. All good. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We'll look forward to it. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Blessings. Bye. Blessings, everyone. Hold the feeling like you would a little child, said the Sufi. <laughs>